MTG for that very generous introduction, and thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I apologize, my voice is a little bit scratchy, but I'll do the best I can. Um, I really want to recognize public knowledge for something that they're just so good at, initiating conversations and inviting dialogue. Um, we can't have enough of that. Uh, it never hurts. We won't always disagree. We won't always agree. Uh, but. Uh, we can certainly try to find points of consensus, and we can't do that until we have the conversation. So uh, I'm happy to be here today. I think copyright policy discussions in particular are often fraught with tension, uh, to say the least. Uh, but uh, the more variety of viewpoints that we have, the better our policy will be. I'd like to say just a few words about the Copyright Office. Uh, I will assume that you all know lots about the Copyright Office, but just in case. Uh, Copyright Office is located on Capitol Hill, where we've been part of the Library of Congress since 1870. The office, uh, very broadly speaking, administers the Copyright Act. That is, it, it administers the registration function and the uh, public office function, which is to record copyright ownership information and other documents pertaining to copyright for the benefit of the public. We also administer statutory licenses. And we uh, have a policy function uh, that goes back uh, a very long way. We work very closely with Congress to advise them on policy issues, draft legislation, and so forth. We also work very closely with other federal departments and agencies, and we provide expertise and information uh, to those executive branch agencies as well as the courts. Uh, I would like to recognize some of my staff who are here today and some of my colleagues. Uh, so if the Copyright Office people and Library of Congress people could raise their hands, I'll just uh, give a quick shout out. So we've got uh, <laughs> lots of folks here, and lots more, I should say, listening to the webcast. And uh, Hope O'Keefe is here. She's Associate General Counsel at the library. Next to her is Steve Winslow, Assistant General Counsel, correct, Steve, at the library. Michelle Woods, who runs the Policy and International Affairs Shop currently at the Copyright Office. Next to her is Special Advisor to the Acting Register. Chris Reed. Next to him is Josh Sackler from the Policy and International Affairs Office. In the back we have Rob Kasnick, who is General, Deputy General Counsel and uh, uh, quite a thoughtful uh, advocate of fair use and an expert in our office, our resident expert, I would say. Did I miss anyone? Uh, so I know they join me in, in being very excited to be part of this and again thanks to Public Knowledge for including us. So my job as a copyright lawyer I think today uh, as the decidingly uncool speaker on a list of very cool people, uh, is to uh, maybe give some history of fair use and get us to the point where we are today, where it's still a vibrant, flexible doctrine after so many, many decades, uh, and something that we are today celebrating. So uh, I think uh, it's such an essential provision in our law that it, it is as worthy a cause for celebration as the principles of free expression that are intertwined within it. It also deserves very serious respect, uh, so as not to lose it, not to abuse it, and to keep it healthy and, and vibrant. Uh, it's not a matter of convenience for not finding rights holders when that is appropriate. Uh, questions are always very complex. It's all about the details. In the Copyright Office policy uh, team, we live in details. We live in nuance. It's all about the details. And I would say that the things that make fair use frustrating for some uh, for example, the uncertainty that is inherent in the law and intended in the doctrine, uh, or the narrowness of some of the decisions handed down by the courts, uh, are the very things that have kept it flexible and adaptable over the years. So uh, what's the history? Well, fair use, as you probably all know, has been part of our law since 1841, has its origins in the Statute of Anne in England. Originally a judicially created doctrine, it was codified in the Copyright Act of 1976, the Section 107, and the Copyright Office was very much involved in those days in that codification and very much advocating for the codification. Uh, it requires the court to consider four factors, and I'm not going to list them because I always find that so incredibly tedious. Instead, I'm going to ask you what they are. So, factor one is purpose and character of the use. I think I heard that. Second one is? This is fair, World's Fair Use Day. <laughs> Nature of the copyrighted work. Third one is? 
Excellent. You all know that one. The amount and substantiality of the portion used and the last one. Excellent. Effect upon the market or potential market for the work. So Congress intended the codification to reflect the flexible structure of the common law uh, that, that preceded it and empowered the judiciary to engage in its unique fact-finding role. Uh, since the doctrine is an equitable rule of reason, there is no general definition. And uh, that has been reflected time and time again. Representative Kastenmeier, who was so influential in passing the 1976 Act in his capacity on the Judiciary Committee of the House, um, had this to say. Uh, since the doctrine is an equitable rule of reason, we don't want a general definition. Each case must be raised, raising the question and deciding on its own facts. The criteria of fair use are necessarily set forth in general terms. It is the intent of this legislature to provide an appropriate balancing of the rights of creators and the needs of users. So technological developments obviously lead to new ways of creating, that's what many of you do, new ways of creating, and new ways of distributing copyrighted works. Technology almost always outpaces the law, that's no secret, we all know that. A uh, flexible standard should allow the courts to consider these new technologies and business models. And I would just say that, in my view, I think the courts have generally been very thoughtful in considering new technologies and keeping the fair use doctrine flexible and adaptable. Uh, so let's go back to the couple of cases that really triggered the technological application, that context for fair use. So Williams and Wilkins, probably the first real technology case. That was 1973, and that involved the great technology of photocopying. So that was the watershed case, and that was the first time where the court, the Supreme Court, had recognized that photocopying, uh, which of course by its nature involves, in some instances, the whole work uh, for particular purposes, could be fair use under certain circumstances. Uh, in 1984, of course, we had the Sony decision, and Sony developed a video recording device, as you all know, uh, which just seems so ancient today, but it was so exciting then. And uh, in that capacity, the court of course, confined their decision to private non-commercial time shifting, but again recognized that the fair use doctrine could be migrated and should apply. In Sega, in 1992, which involved a reverse engineering of game cartridges to build new interoperable software, again the decision was yes, fair use. In that case, Accolade reverse engineered a number of Sega's video games so they could develop their own games. Um, that was in the Ninth Circuit. Then we go to 2003, in another case I'm sure everybody here knows, Kelly via Rebusoft, again, fair use, yes. And that involved, of course, a search engine that enabled internet users to conduct uh, searches using thumbnail images. Sometimes courts have been sensitive to balance and find, finding against fair use when they believe that the finding will harm the underlying principles of copyright. So one case in which that was the court's opinion was Grokster. And in that case, the primary thing that the court considered was that Grokster was holding itself out to be a source for copyright infringing material. So let's go away from technology for a moment and just talk about uh, something that I think is probably very important to this crowd, but, but the cultural context in which fair use decisions have been rendered. As I said, it has very close ties to our First Amendment principles, speech and free speech and expression. And sometimes that plays in favor of fair use, and sometimes it's the copyright exclusive rights, which is the engine of the free expression, and the court will balance those two things. So in Harper and Rowe, uh, the decision from the court in a case where The Nation magazine scooped Harper and Rowe on the Ford memoirs, the finding was it was not fair use because they scooped, took the heart of the matter, and basically uh, competed with the distribution of that information that was important to the public. In other words, copyright was the engine in that case. However, that case is important for another reason, uh, because it began a line of cases that addressed fair use in unpublished materials. I won't go through those cases today, but those are important to free expression. Uh, it's still a tension in copyright law, the extent to which unpublished work should possibly receive heightened protection. Uh, but suffice it to say, it ended with that that line in the in section 107 that essentially says it shall not be 
uh, the fact that a work is unpublished does not necessarily bar a finding of fair use. And that's how that began. Another interesting case that I just wanted to raise with you is a Ninth Circuit case of Los Angeles News Service versus KCAL-TV. Uh, in that case, which again was a finding against fair use, uh, there was an interesting discussion about licensing. In that case, the TV station had requested permission, it had been denied, and then they went on in commercial context to go ahead and make the use. The court said that there could be a negative impact on the licensing market for news footage. We'll come back to that licensing component because that's important as you consider fair use. So let's talk a little bit about free expression at, in, the, in the form of parody, which is my favorite section of the fair use uh, debate and something that I spent a lot of time working on when I was at the Guggenheim, which was just, uh, and, and also they make for the best slides. So let's start though with music. Uh, you probably know these uh, cases. I don't know if all of you know the songs. Probably you do. Uh, but Campbell v. Acuff Rose uh, was a parody case that the court struggled with. I think in part people think because they were trying to figure out if they got the parody, right? That's what people say when they talk about this case. So let's just see if I can figure out how to play these slides. Uh, this is Oh Pretty Woman by Roy Orbison. Can you hear that? Some of you were tapping along, I noticed, to that. And then we have two live crew making fun of the song. Just see what Orbison's face listening to this. <laughs> Court found that Two Live Crew was commenting on the song. They needed to use the song in order to, to comment, uh, which in the form of parody, which is, in, in, of course, a form of free expression. So. Uh, they also said this, they said, Two Live Crew's actions do not necessarily suggest that they believe their version was not fair use, the fact that they asked for permission and it was denied, but the offer may simply have been made in good faith effort to avoid the litigation. So don't hold it against people just because they asked and then went on to make, make a decision that in fact they didn't, they didn't, it didn't matter, they could still claim fair use. The commercial nature of the parody does not render it presumptively unfair, another very important uh, line from the Supreme Court. So let's go to the Second Circuit now, uh, and to my visual art leanings. <clears throat> this is the Rogers v. Coons case. This is a photograph of puppies, and uh, this is the sculpture that Coons created. So the photograph and the sculpture. And the court said, not fair use. Uh, in this case, there's another theme of bad faith, good faith, in that uh, Coons not only didn't ask for permission, but not that he had to, right? We just learned that. But he tore off the copyright notice off of the photograph, and the court just didn't like that, didn't like that behavior. Uh, Coons said he was commenting on the banality of everyday uh, photography and life. Court said, huh. Basically, they said, if you say so. So, not fair use. Coons brings us lots of copyright cases, and that's why we love him. Um, 2006, this is Blanche V. Coons. I was involved in this one because they sued the Guggenheim as well, because we had commissioned the photograph in which he took this photograph from an ad of a woman's foot, right here, and inversed it and included it in a painting. So in this, he's commenting 
uh, according to the artist, on the banality of everyday life. It's a theme with him. Consumption. And the court this time said, okay, it's fair use. We went along with it. Um, the court said this, notwithstanding the fact that artists are sometimes paid and museums sometimes earn money, <laughs> sometimes earn money, the public exhibition of art is widely and we think properly considered to have value that benefits the broader public interest. Okay, now let's go to the Ninth Circuit because it wouldn't be a fair use talk without blender Barbie and enchilada Barbie. And uh, if you don't know, if you, first of all, if you don't know the Ninth Circuit and copyright, you, it's really a lot of fun. But, but secondly, uh, if, if you uh, are at all involved in parody in your own business models, you really should read these cases. So uh, this, of course, just outraged Mattel, right? They, you know, Barbie with her all-American good looks and reputation has now been put into adult-oriented artistic photographs as parody. Mattel didn't buy the parody. They didn't get the parody. They thought uh, it was just blatant infringement and in a way that did great damage to their doll. And the court said this. Yes, Barbie is sometimes frazzled looking, sometimes ridiculous, and apparently in dangerous situations. The lighting, the background, the props, and the camera angles uh, transform Barbie, however. <laughs> Barbie is about to be destroyed or harmed by domestic life in the form of kitchen appliances, yet she continues displaying her well-known smile. <laughs> Disturbingly oblivious to her predicament, she looks defenseless. In other photographs, the doll is in sexually suggestive contexts. Yeah, I think I have one of those too. There's Barbie. <laughs> the court says it's not difficult to see the commentary that the artist intended or the harm that he perceived in Barbie's influence on gender roles. Fair use, yes. So before I end, I just want to mention uh, the licensing um, factor in all of this. The case that I'm sure you all know of that stands for licensing and really kind of put it on the map in terms of the fourth factor is the American Geophysical Union versus Texaco case, 1994. And in that, the court held that the defendant's copying of, in this case, scientific journals that were being passed around in office, uh, in, instead of passing the journal around, they were making copies of articles uh, as they needed and passing them to their colleagues, uh, which I'm sure none of you do in your offices. And uh, the court said it exceeded fair use, and in part they held that because they said the Copyright Clearance Center was up and running and the defendants could have licensed the works. In other words, there was a potential market, there was even a real market for those. And that dance, uh, I would say, is a healthy dance. The dance between efficient licensing, cost-effective licensing, which everybody wants when licensing is appropriate, and fair use. So. Um, as I end, I would just like to, again, thank Gigi for including the Copyright Office today. And I would say about fair use, uh, embrace it, respect it, and celebrate it. Thank you.